Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Block Planet 50 uh, celebration. Uh, I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. Colorado College is located in Colorado Springs, Colorado, within the unceded territory of the Ute people. The earliest documented peoples also include the Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne. An extended list of tribes with a legacy of occupation in Colorado can be found on the Indigenous Community at CC webpage. I'm Steve Hayward, and I am an associate professor at the English department. And it's my it's a thrill to be joined here by uh, Dean Susan Ashley, uh, professor of history. Hello, Susan. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank so you. So what we're gonna <laughs> what we're gonna do today is give you a little bit of a uh, of a kind of a taste of what we've been working on for the last uh, few years and tell you a little bit about uh, when you're going to be able to access some of the stuff that we've been working on. And so let's just get uh, right into it and um, begin with looking at, um, let me see here, uh, begin with looking at uh, the, uh, the cover of Susan's book, The Block Plan, an unrehearsed educational venture. Uh, now, Susan, can you tell us a little bit about the title? Where does the title come from? And what's the story of around this cover? It's a very familiar image. Can you tell us a little bit about it? The title comes from what people now commonly refer to as our special uh, approach to teaching and learning. But in the beginning, it wasn't called the block plan. In the beginning, it was part of a master planning process. And so early on, it got the name master plan. But once they figured out exactly what that master plan was going to be, they decided they would call it the new college plan. And so it went by that name and the Colorado College plan. But once they approved it, virtually within a week of the approval of the block plan, someone realized that the new college plan was not the best title for the block plan because there was a new college in Florida. And they thought that if they called it the new college plan, someone might get confused and think that it wasn't the Colorado College plan. And so it became the Colorado College plan. And only slowly and rather insidiously with no official uh, action at all, it became the block plan. And now the system itself is referred to as the block plan, I think, generally by other institutions and, and, and people in higher education. So it's kind of like aspirin. Um, uh, a name for one thing becomes a name for the generic label. Uh, the subtitle, An Unrehearsed Educational Venture, invokes one of those phrases and occasions which enters the rhetoric of an institution so in 1974, when CC celebrated its centennial, uh, it invited, among many other luminaries, a political theorist from England named Michael Oakeshott. And he addressed his audience saying something like this, I've come across the Atlantic to find myself in a familiar place, a place of learning. And he described what uh, learning was like, and he described it with these words, it is an unrehearsed intellectual adventure. And CC has used those words in various ways uh, ever since. But this version of it focuses on um, the spontaneity and the organic origins of the block plan, the unrehearsed part of the block plan. It wasn't an imitation of anything, really. And the um, venture part uh, uh, alludes to the risk they took when they embarked on this uh, not completely unknown course, but one which was uh, not, which didn't exist at that moment anyplace else. The picture is one of um, uh, the many, well, the, the efforts to figure out if they could actually do the block plan before they presented it. And so those are students taking a look and others taking a look at this gigantic chart, which I think they put in this case in Rastel Center. And then there is a little heart there that says, I love the block plan. And this is, is a great background because it gives you some sort of sense of the enthusiasm for the block plan, especially at the very beginning and on the part of students who were among the major advocates of, of the change. And also were critical in the early planning stages because they um, banded around Glenn Brooks 
They were known as the Brooks's Raiders and tried to make this happen. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. I love the title. And uh, just to say a little bit about what we're going to do, I should have said this at the start, but what we're going to do today is we're going to go and, uh, and talk a little bit about um, the, this process that we've been on. As, as everyone who's, I think, tuned in is, is, uh, knows, there's going to be sort of three linked uh, things that we're going to be releasing. And we can, we can now disclose the, uh, the release date. It will be Valentine's Day 2021, February 14th, Valentine's Day. Uh, 2021, when we will be releasing all three of our things, including uh, Professor Ashley's uh, book. Um, and what we thought we'll do here today is we'll sort of go through, we'll talk a little bit about the process. We've been working pretty closely. If, uh, how long has it been, Susan, since we embarked on these, on this uncommon uh, research venture that you and I have been on? I think it's been about three years, eh? Spring of 2017. Yeah, and so we've been talking about the block plan a lot over that time. And so we'll talk about that process and some of the things that surprised us, some of the things that we learned, um, and also talk about some of the people that we spoke to uh, along the way. And then we're going to show uh, the trailer, a new, the new trailer of the, uh, of the documentary, as well as a scene uh, from it. So moving on so one of the people that we knew um pretty early that we would have to uh talk to and this is uh again valentine's day 2021 is uh glenn brooks and uh there's a picture of uh, professor brooks uh i think back in sort of 69 uh, 70 and there's a picture of uh, professor brooks and myself uh when we were interviewing him uh for the documentary now uh brooks is a, really a foundational figure when it comes to uh, the founding of the block plan. And I wonder, Susan, if you could say a little bit about uh, his role and what was it during this? I mean, you've talked to him before about uh, the uh, about the block plan, and it's no secret that he's involved, to say the least, in its founding. In this, this was an opportunity for us to have much sustained conversation with Glenn Brooks. Did you, what did you find that surprised you during this process? The process of talking with Glenn? With Glenn, yeah. Um, <clears throat> two things really. Uh, one is how masterful, masterfully he uh, organized this entire process. I mean, to turn a college into a completely different curriculum in less than a year is is really unusual. I mean, everybody knows that professors don't like to change anything. And this happened uh, remarkably rapidly for some very particular reasons. And it ended up in this kind of a, 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 a change also for very particular reasons. But I think the thing that's uh, two things, as I said, surprised me. One was I figured out that he asked the one question which would actually elicit change. And that question was, how is it that we can do what we do better? They already knew what they did. They were a liberal arts college offering a liberal arts education. And so it was, how can we do this better than we're doing it? Which gave people the sense that they could actually change something. The other thing um, which struck me is conversations which were uh, surrounded uh, looking back on the plan and looking at the plan now. And that is, um, is, I suppose, a measure of disappointment in how it turned out. Hmm. I mean, in what sense do you think? Um, I think that they, and we probably will get to this a little more at the end, I think they thought it was going to be this extraordinarily flexible system, which opened all sorts of options. And in fact, it did, but not at all in the way in which they expected. Yeah, and it's it's interesting the way that and they would often in in our discussions with uh, with all the people who were who we talked to, we would sort of come in and Glenn Brooks was one of the only people who I'd met before we began this process. Most of the people who I we spoke to in the course of making this uh, documentary, uh, uh, they knew Susan really well, and they did not know me at all. And so that was one of the really interesting things. And and often they would. They would turn to me and say something. Well, Stephen, this is what you know the way that we thought. But it's it's an important thing to keep in mind. You know, the, both the context of uh, the adoption of the block plan, as you said, 
um, jokingly, but but it's actually true that academics tend to not want to change up the thing that they're do, right? Uh, and it's, it's institutions, there's a certain metabolism to institutions of higher education, which is to say it's very, it's very slow, right? They tend not to change very quickly. But uh, there's a certain particular opening that happens uh, in this country, maybe globally, at the end of the 60s into the beginning of the 70s. It's a great ex moment of experiment in higher education. And certainly um, that grows out of all kinds of, uh, all kinds of social, uh, different kinds of unrest. And, uh, and the block plan is a reflection of that. And one of the things that is interesting about the block plan is that it, it persists uh, until uh, today. And so that's one of the, uh, the interesting things that uh, right now, what we're seeing is a lot of, and I'm seeing some questions in the Q&A about other schools that are thinking about adopting the block plan and this. And as you said, we'll return to this point, but um, today, a lot of schools in the country, in this country are seeing the block plan or compressed learning or module learning as a way of edging into a, uh, a semester uh, that's surrounded by COVID-19. In other words, reading the blog plan is a schedule. And what I, if, if I'm just, just re-articulating what you're saying, Brooks and the founders of the plan, they see it as the absence of a schedule. Is that right? Yes, they see it as being very liberating. Although um, all of them understand the potential for um, developing rigidity and orthodoxies, which in fact happens. Um, but the, the rigidities themselves produce other uh, dynamism in it. And so the dynamism of the, of the block plan currently is not where they expected. They expected it to be in course formats. Uh, they didn't expect it to be in the content of the curriculum. They purposely avoided making any change in the nature of the curriculum itself, the substance of the curriculum, the content. But that's where the block plan has proved to be exceptionally dynamic. Uh, they expected teaching to change, but I don't think they had any idea about how radically it would change. And yeah. so, yeah. so um, do uh, we talked to uh, Professor Brooks, of course. Now, one of the um, one of the I guess uh, incidents around the founding of the Block Plan that's inserted itself into the mythology of the college is this uh, this meeting at Murphy's Bar where uh, Glenn Brooks was joined by two other colleagues and um, famously one of them said, just give me uh, 15 students and um, let me teach them. Now, that person who said it was uh, Professor uh, Shern, Don Shern, who I think is with us uh, as we speak here. So hello, uh, hello, Don Shern. Here he is pictured on the left around uh, 69 or 70 and pictured uh, on the right during the filming of the documentary during which uh, I asked him to, to smile. Uh, Don was very, uh, uh, sort of made a lot of jokes about being in Chauve. Now, uh, Susan, in terms of uh, Don's uh, uh, contribution to the, the block plan, uh, one of the things that, that you found was this apparent, you know, pivotal statement in Murphy's. It was actually a statement that Professor Shearn had made before. Yes, I mean, that's part of the myth that, that it was as if it just dawned on Don that if he had 15 students teaching them and, and only them, things would be much, much better. Um, I mean, at least I, I thought that was the story until I came upon some documents that suggested that this was something he, uh, he had this idea for a long time and he tried it out for a long time and he tried it out to complete indifference or, or absolute skepticism. Nobody nobody thought it was uh, appealing. Uh, so so uh, it's one of those ideas, I guess, whose time has come. But one thing that we were talking about before was the reluctance of um, colleges to change, except in this period there was a lot of ferment. But one, one of the things which I found most intriguing about the block plan is that a year before they passed the block plan, they had rejected two other possibilities. One was to go to a 3-3. Three, three. And they said, a 3-3, three, three, you can't do that. I mean, that, that's not gonna work. And they actually then voted on a 4-2 and defeated it resoundingly. That means four courses per semester. They said, 
you can't do that because uh, students won't get a liberal arts education and you can't do the other because how in the world can you teach anything reasonably decently in 10 weeks time and so then they just do this this 360 i'm not i really it's very hard to understand what changed their minds in in the space of a year maybe glenn maybe glenn. so then you know just to just to say the end is so the, there were a number of innovations or changes that were proposed just before the block plan that were far less innovative than the block plan. Right. And um, certainly a figure that's important, and I noticed that the Sondermans are in the audience uh, today, was uh, Fred Sonderman uh, saying, uh, really sort of issuing this provocation to say, um, you know, we're coming up on this anniversary of the college, why not instead of, uh, celebrating it that we we change things we think we look forward into the next hundred years and certainly that was that was part of the part of the atmosphere right of that of that kind of you know but it was not a sure thing in other words that the block plan would go through because there had been these initiatives that had come to the faculty floor and uh and not made it was it who was it, it was uh, owen uh professor kramer was telling me uh, about uh, something was often said that well we failed we failed last time so we might fail this time or some you know well, well we'll fa we failed we'll, we'll fail this time but we we failed who was that I I don't remember I don't Doug Fried maybe yeah anyway but so anyway that was uh, one of the things when um, my my first meeting with uh, Professor Shern which was as I, I say around this uh, was when he was. I did a kind of a pre-interview with him uh, to see, you know, how he, how it would go. Uh, and um, I remember uh, he sat down across from me and he said, I know that you want to talk about the block plan, Stephen, but I want to, I want to throw out a couple of other ideas or three other ideas to you first that I think should be implemented now at the college. And uh, I was like, okay, well, what are they? And I don't remember the, the two of them, but he had, he had a lot of ideas. And he seems like that kind of that kind of a creative force, right? Somebody who has it's it's a kind of interesting. I mean, if the if the story that we're telling here uh, about the blog plan is one about institutional change, about the way in which Colorado College has shifted, um, it's certainly about an, a story about innovation. It's not just one thing to have. We often tell ourselves this story about you need to have the idea, but you but one of the things that that this story is is it's one in which you not just have the, you don't just have to have the idea you have to have the idea and then have it again and then say it again and then say it within the right uh context so there we have glenn brooks we have uh, dawn shern and then the third uh figure who is really fundamental in the history of the block plan is of course uh professor uh fuller who is uh pictured here on the left a very young uh professor fuller now in his i think 52nd year of teaching at the college maybe 53rd and there he is over uh during the uh filming of the documentary uh susan how do you how would you talk about uh professor fuller's role in this now as i understand it he had a particular role to play in the movement from the college's teaching nine blocks is it to eight I think some people in the audience will remember at the beginning it was nine blocks and at the beginning teachers taught nine blocks, nine of nine. They increased their workload by 50% when they moved to the block plan. And some of them had some sort of premonition that they might be working that much harder as a result. Uh, but they also got smaller classes. Uh, so um, one, uh, I think that that Tim himself would say that one of his contributions that he was that he was part of that trio at Murphy's Bar that was talking about um, this idea that Don Shuren brought up. But later, um, he, he occupied numerous roles at the college, but later when the faculty really got fed up with teaching so much and so hard, uh, <clears throat> they had achieved uh, uh, teaching eight of nine, but decided that wasn't enough and they wanted to just cut the year down, just to reduce the length of the year. He was a member of a renegade committee that said enough is enough, we really are gonna drive this home. And they proposed to do this in 1986 and created, generated a gigantic furor. Um, 
among alums, um, students who said, wait a second, what do you take us for, fools? I mean, how can you reduce the number of blocks and not reduce tuition? And then uh, most significantly, it generated a great deal of opposition in the Board of Trustees. And, and um, I, I encourage you to take a look at Glenn Brook's oral history because he will tell you exactly what happened uh, between him and the Board of Trustees as a result of that. But Tim uh, knew a lot of members of the board and had an established reputation as a, a sage. And uh, he was, uh, he took it upon himself to, to emphasize the educational benefits of going to an eight block year. And actually the sacrifice that the faculty was making by giving up a block. Um, <clears throat> if it were shorter, they would work harder, they would have a better balance in their lives. And so he did a great deal of the, of the framing of this, um, this movement, which was considered to be, I think, uh, the president at the time, Gresham Riley, said that the nine block year had achieved some of the sanctity of the virgin birth. And so that this was, was really a, a difficult thing to put across. But Tim was instrumental in, in seeing to it that people understood the necessity of this. And in fact, um, Gresham Riley, the president, thought that had they not gone then to the eight block year, we probably wouldn't have the block plan. That yeah, was it was, it was uh, one of the interesting things about this process is that, um, you know, Susan and I, when we did all these interviews, we were interested in different things. <laughs> uh, like to say, to say the least. Now, in part, um, in part, <laughs> in part, that's because we are interested in different things. But in, but it's also the case that we were making uh, different things. So, Susan's uh, book is a very rigorous uh, history of the block plan, a real study and in institutional change uh, assessment uh, of the block. And I, I was making, you know, something else. I was making a film and a podcast. And uh, so Susan would would drill into like the procedural detail. Who and then. How many was it a was it a, a was it a binding vote? Susan would often ask with with a kind of you know was that a binding vote that you were doing or how many motions did it pass or was that the third amendment to the and and I would say something like what was the weather like that day or where were you sitting where were you sitting you know who, were who you was sitting, sitting next to you? and uh, and yes. so that was that was and one of the things that very early on the process that Susan was extremely interested in and that I was not interested in was the movement from the nine to the eight block year, which to me, you know, I'm, you know, I'm relatively new on the scene. Now I, I've been teaching at Colorado College, I guess 12 years now. And Susan, you arrived at the college like nine, 1971, is it? 97, the year the block plan started. The year the block plan started. So we really came at it from different perspectives. And uh, it was, I, I really didn't, you know, I, I had, was trying to figure out why Susan was so into the nine to the eight block year. And uh, it was really a, in an interview <clears throat> with, uh, with Gresham Riley, in which I was saying something like, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't provoke him or anything. I said something like, you know, why is that important? I said really just sort of like at a moment of unselfconsciousness, but why is that even important? He said, listen, listen, the block plan, survives because it can change and that was like the important thing for me that was a real moment you know the block plan when people hear about the block plan hear about this module modular way of learning what they hear is the rigidity of the schedule what they hear is like a, a shape that can't be messed with and uh, really the uh, the that is the way in which the block plan is fundamentally different from the other innovations of the late 60s and 1970s. Is that it had it built into an ability to change, and I think that is something, and this is something that the documentary does. It looks at the um, not just the past of the block plan, but also the present of the block plan, and leans into the future of it. And I think for those of us um, uh, at the college now, that this is really uh, an important thing to remember that the block plan was was is is something that can can alter uh, and, and can change. It is, it is a model that is what we make it. And so um, it's interesting uh, also when thinking about, we didn't really, you know, about the people who we would have liked to get into uh, the film. One thing, we, we had a very early interview with Ray Werner, 
uh, you know, former professor of economics, uh, in the, sort of a, a pivotal person, uh, Susan, within the history of the Block Clan, in that uh, after the vote, and the vote is a kind of a split vote, right? It isn't unanimous. Uh, he's one of the people, I guess, who stands up and says, let's make it unanimous, right? Well, that's the story. That, that's what, you know, you, you see how confused people are about the most basic things. So one thing is uh, at, this, at the critical vote. Um, do you want to talk about that now, Steve? Um, yeah, we can. Uh, well, why don't we talk just, just briefly about it? We'll come back to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, both Glenn and Lou Warner remember that uh, at that critical meeting, when they came to the vote and voted by paper ballots and had uh, counters from both sides, adversaries and advocates, the vote was uh, 72 to 53. And <clears throat> Lou Warner evidently stopped and said, is this enough? Something so significant, is that enough of a majority? That's a 58% majority. And they had talked about how much of a majority was enough, and uh, one suggestion was two-thirds, and somebody said no faculty ever votes two-thirds for anything, significant or insignificant, so forget two-thirds. And uh, I remember that Bob Levy, who was the resident expert on voting, said 55% uh, is a landslide in politics. But they decided not to specify. It had to be a significant majority. And so Lou said, okay, is this a significant majority? And some people stood up and said, look, you know, you don't, um, you don't create majorities depending on the issue. Uh, and we have voted for things that were just as serious uh, with more slender margins than this. And then people started to say, well, and besides, you know, we've been consulted. Everybody's had the chance to talk. And someone stood up and said, I move to implement the block plan. And the someone was an opponent. Glenn remembers that it was Ray Werner. Lou Warner remembers that it was Ray Werner. Ray Werner insists he did not do it. <laughs> Van Shaw, a sociology professor who was also an outspoken opponent who did it. But the minutes of the meeting say, it was neither Ray Werner nor Van Shaw. It was a philosophy professor that some of you will remember named Hans Krim. And that um, they did not move to make it unanimous because they knew there was one person who no matter what would vote no. And so it was. Uh, it was uh, unanimous except for one negative vote. The negative vote came from an economist who later left the college. But yes, Ray Werner was an outspoken opponent, but as soon as it was voted, he said, I don't like it, but I'm, we all need to do everything possible to make this work. And I think that, and we, uh, we literally, uh, we lost him just before we, like, like just as we were getting ready uh, to film, we did a pre-interview and it was literally, I, would, I had set up the interview and um, we were ready to, to go with it. I was calling and I got the sad news that he had passed away. And certainly part of, the, part of this project that added urgency for us when we got started on it, just as soon as we could, was because of that, that feeling of urgency that we really wanted to, um, to talk to everyone that we could while we could. And uh, Professor Werner, such an interesting, uh, important person. What a, what a character. Um, uh, now we'll just move on to a couple of other, a number of other people that we talked to and talk about their place within this story. Uh, Elaine Freed and Judy Finley. Uh, now these, the two of them, they were members of the planning office. Uh, and can you say a little bit about what the planning office was and uh, what you discovered around a book that, uh, yes. that was, a book that they read uh, or that I guess it was Elaine who read this book that really did impact the college in, in an important way. Right. The planning office was evidently a very small room in the basement of Armstrong Hall. But of course, <clears throat> it has gained capital letters and a great role in the establishment of the block plan. 
uh, Glenn was the head of the planning office and he had the great advantage of, of the, the help of two extraordinarily proficient professionals, Judy Finley and Elaine Freed. And Elaine remembers that um, she had read a book by Peter Drucker, who was a specialist in management. And she thought this book has, it really has something to say about how you get something this big approved. And then something, it has some things about what, what we're doing, the substance of what we're, we're thinking of doing. And so she asked, uh, she advised him to read it, Glenn Brooks to read it, and he did. And he asked uh, the cabinet to read it, the senior staff to read it, Lou Warner to read it. And you'd think that people wouldn't remember, but Glenn Brooks does remember reading this. And uh, others also mention Peter Drucker in this book when they're recalling the block plan. And one of the things he said was, uh, <clears throat> nobody really can do anything more than two things at a time. And then he added, maybe Mozart. I have no idea why he said maybe Mozart. <laughs> but then he also had some other really good suggestions. He's, for example, he said, just with, if there are any options, any alternatives, be sure to give those alternatives as much attention as you do what you're advocating. And so there were um, technical, tactical, strategic things that he said about a decision making, uh, which if you look at, if you match up the book with what happened with the block plan, it, there is an extraordinary coincidence between the book's recommendations and what, ha what actually happened. And then, uh, she, and then Judy Finley came into the, uh, the planning office. And I, and I, I know that Judy's uh, listening in, and I just want to shout out to her uh, and say that, uh, you know, in addition to the work that she's done in the planning office, uh, those of you who might not probably know this, but if you don't know this, um, the, the person who's responsible for <coughs> the whole of the oral history uh, of Colorado mm -hmm. College in the archives as it stands right now is Judy Finley, who conducted these remarkable in-depth interviews. And Judy's work uh, has been, it's, there's, there's no more important resource to the work that we have been doing over these last several years. Is that right, Susan? I would completely agree. And she always asked the right question for us. Uh, what were you doing when, when they talked about the block plan, if they were involved at all in the block plan? Uh, I th yes, she was able to elicit amazing secrets and indiscretions. Yeah. <laughs> ended up being extremely useful to both of us, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Judy is one of the great interviewers of all time, able to sometimes like a, an hour or an hour and a half into uh, a, uh, an interview, just ask a very penetrating, just the right question. So, uh, you know, just a, just a real shout out to, uh, to Judy Finley uh, and, and the amazing work that she's done. I should also say that these incredible photographs here uh, we're done uh, and they're given to us today for our use uh, by Brian Beasley, uh, who's the co-director of the documentary uh, with me. And uh, these are this, thank you for this, Brian. These are just fantastic. Uh, our next two people to talk about, uh, Jane Cavell and uh, Bill Hockman. Now, Jane, an important figure, very much an opponent to the block plan. And there was another plan. This is what you were talking about, the other plan that was, she was one of the, most often identified with her. It, it, uh, I'm not sure why, uh, maybe because she survived the others, but it was Glenn Gray, Doug Fox, Doug Mertz, and Frank Kretzky. So uh, five of the most eminent faculty members. She would have been the youngest of the crew, I think. And they were cautious they thought that the best thing to do would be to have a hybrid system. And so you'd have blocks in the interim, as many other institutions did at the time, between the fall and the spring semesters, you would have a, a block arrangement. And then in semesters, you would have um, <clears throat> programs. So you could take a, a collection of courses in these programs. And they advocated uh, that particular um, option saying it would be good for us to try. We could try out the block plan, a block system in that context. And all the other opponents of the block plan who had their own alternatives rallied to that one. And so that one 
the planning office paid as much attention to that, figuring out the feasibility of that, as they had to the, the what became the block plan. Uh, so, and I think she eventually rallied. She liked the, she liked um, the interdisciplinary options that she could te co-teach with people, and she liked the idea of traveling with students to other locations. And so those things were were for her. Uh, they sold the plan. And Frank Krutsky, who was an English professor, he recalled that, that he, he converted too. He said, once I saw that students liked it, I said, I like it too. Yeah, and uh, I think that that's, that's a story that we encountered a lot, that often the, the most vociferous opponents of the plan would become some of the best teachers on the plan. And certainly uh, Professor Hawkman, who we lost, another person who we lost during the film, and somebody who was close to... Uh, uh, to both of us. I knew uh, Bill Hockman uh, through the mind and body softball team uh, as a result of when I arrived at the college, uh, the dean of the college at the time said to me, you need to play on this softball team. That was yourself, uh, uh, Susan, uh, who, who, and so that was a, a one of the amazing things uh, in, is the interview that uh, we had a chance to interview most of many of these people uh, like Bill Hockman for the last time. And uh, uh, one of the things that's coming out of the documentary is that those interviews in their entirety will be housed in the archive, as will some of the other things that we found during, uh, during our, our work. And the interview that we had uh, with Bill Hockman, I think, was he 92 when we... Uh, uh, I think older than that. I think a little older than that. 90, in his 90s. We, uh, we finished it. It was one of the most um, remarkable interviews. Can you say a little bit about um, your relationship to Bill and um, how he figures in this story? Well, he happened to be on sabbatical the year that they developed the block plan. And I've often wondered what would have happened had he been there because he was a very forceful voice in the faculty. And uh, you wonder if he would have gotten converted to it or if he would have opposed it and, and what its fate would have been if he, if he had been there. So he returned to find this whole new system under which he had to teach and, and he never reconciled. I, I, I always thought he was, a, you know, a supporter of the block plan. But when I talked to him uh, in 2017 about this, he said, no, you know, I, I've never been a fan. I, um, <laughs> Ideal class was um, freedom and authority, and and he didn't think you could replicate that with the block line. You couldn't get the that the kind of the long term germination of ideas which he felt he had uh, students were able to achieve with 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 semesters. <clears throat> but uh, I, I mean, Bill Bill Hockman is one of a kind. He was the he he aimed to be the conscience of the college, and he had his uh, four things that had to happen if the college was to be great. Uh, and one of them was to get rid of Division I athletics, another was to get rid of ROTC, another was to get rid of the business major, and then fraternities and sororities. He, he got three or four. Yeah, and, he, and I think you're absolutely right. When I, t I talked to him, he, he, he's a very enthusiastic person, and his enthusiasm for teaching came across, but not his enthusiasm for the block plan. No. He, no. Uh, he never wavered uh, on that. Um, and then just a couple more here. Carlton Gamer and Max Taylor were also people who we spoke to. Uh, now, Carlton was important uh, for us to talk to because the music department was, an, was generally opposed to the block plan, although Carlton voted for it, if I recall. And uh, can you say a little bit about Max and his role? He was at the college at the time. He's very much a historical consciousness as well. He was um, given the job at the very beginning of evaluating the block plan. And so he worked at that, it was an internal evaluation for two years, and then they did uh, a more extensive external evaluation. And he was, he collaborated with a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, to evaluate the plan. Uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, because he was so close to the operation of, of, you know, developing and implementing the plan, he did some early um, histories of step-by-step -step histories of, of, of what happened. Plus, now he remembers everything. And he has a, a phenomenal memory. He's 
very clear and will um, and, and, and will actually uh, say things that are uh, central but uh, could be considered to be somewhat indiscreet mm. respect so so I have a greatly appreciated um, speaking with him and having him uh, comb the the manuscript of the book for for uh, errors one person that we really have to acknowledge uh, who is not with us is Lou Warner because I think uh, people will say it would never have happened without Glenn Brooks and that's absolutely true but it would not have happened without Lou Warner as president he was an extraordinary uh, leader who who uh, took Fred Sonderman's suggestion when he said, why don't we do something for the centennial that looks ahead, not behind? He said, fine. And within a week, he'd appointed Glenn Brooks as head of a, of a planning office to do some master plan. He, uh, when Glenn took the idea to, um, to George Drake and, and Lou Warner, he had a five hour meeting and they came out of that and he said, go ahead, keep going, let's see what comes of it. And he's also known for having said, anything that the faculty thinks is academically good is administratively feasible yeah so, so. and he was ever anyone in the audience who remembers lou warner he was he was quite a unique person and very much i, I think he had a whole lot to do with uh cc getting through the vietnam war years uh mm -hmm. with um you know, with, with the entire community feeling pretty much uh, solid. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, one of the things is that there's this meeting that, you know, as soon as, when Glenn Brooks has the idea for the block plan fleshed out enough that he wants to present it to the dean and the president of the college, they have this long meeting in which, which I'll add Drucker, uh, they're going to do one That's thing right. at a time, very block plan, we're going to do one thing at a time, we're going to close the door. And, and Glenn uh, apparently tapes that meeting just as he tapes different things and um one of the things we discovered and this is one of the things that's featured in the podcast is these audio artifacts that we found that were lost for 50 years and so one of the thrills about one of the reasons for doing this podcast is to present it within a context where you can hear for example the uh convocation address the fall convocation address the glenn brooks uh, where he presents the ideas of the block plan of the block plan to the students of Colorado College for the first time. And we haven't heard that for about 50 years. And um, the other, the, uh, this tape though, this moment, the early, the first moment of, uh, you know, the sort of Shakespeare foul papers of the block plan. I remember I, I kept thinking in my many interviews with Glenn Brooks that he, that he knew where it was. I, I said to him at one point, Glenn, I would really like that tape of that meeting that day and he said to me me too you know <laughs> he said, i would like it too so anyway if anybody has it uh you know uh, where uh, to find us so um now i think what we're going to do is we're going to watch a little bit of the uh of the trailer to the movie so everybody just sit back oh sorry we forgot one <laughs> uh, as a, uh, a kind of we thought to give a little bit of historical context i thought what would we do is uh, show a little bit about where we were around 1975. This is uh, Professor Ashley in a standing somewhat reluctantly in a history department photo. Uh, and this is Bill Hoffman up here. And here I am at the typewriter as usual. So I thought we'd go here and watch a little bit of uh, the, uh, the trailer. So sit back. Here we go. This was a radical notion that we were going to do at this little college here out in Colorado Springs, a radical notion. This is insane. I'm going to have to compress a semester into three and a half weeks. Let's just do one thing. Let me do one thing with just a few students. Should we do this? And how would we do this? Consider the state of the student today at Colorado College. We are strong and solid, but we've got to bring time under control. Stop the rat race. I really think it was this meeting that got the block plan started. To the block plan. If it had been two other people, nothing would have happened. 
nothing. I might as well have talked to the bartender. I have the sense that all sorts of zany things happen here. So to learn that the institution itself was going to try something zany, it seemed like, oh, I suppose they will. Welcome new and returning students, faculty, staff, and friends. Opening convocation marks the official beginning of the 145th academic year. One of the things that has been very clear to me since day one at Colorado College is our ability to let the kids lead us. And by the way, the students were only doing what we've taught them to do, and we teach our students well. If you are to remember her for one thing, remember all of the ways she continues to resurrect. There's something that is just so exciting about getting to go somewhere like London, which is the performance capital of the world. The block plan is like anything that a small liberal arts college can offer, but on steroids. With the block plan, it means that we have nine days to work on this documentary. I'm terrified. I've never been this scared for anything school related. It's the block plan. That's why I visited, that's why I applied. It just spoke to me. And all the other things that make color College what it is, it all does stem from the block plan. So there we go. Now, as you can see, one of the, um, I'm just going to imagine uproarious applause out in the virtual world. Uh, <laughs> uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day, 2021. We will be able to see that. We're not going to have a showing of it, but that's when it will be available. Uh, and you can f look out for updates coming your way about that. Now, one of the things that we did is we got, we knowing that this moment at uh, Murphy's Bar, for, for better or for worse, is this moment that is, uh, you know, central in the history of the college we got everyone uh together uh again at uh uh at, at murphy's bar and we uh here we are all um at murphy's bar recreating that moment and professor ashley came as well we you know we actually filmed this at uh at, at like 8 30 in the morning because it was the only time when we could get into the bar when they would let us come in. And so we thought I'd give you a little taste of, of the kind of thing, as you can see uh, from the trailer, I hope. Um, this is not, uh, the documentary is not a, a simply a historical, uh, uh, but it looks at the present and, the, uh, and the, the questions that Colorado College is asking itself right now, as well as the historical, um, that part of it. So uh, what we're gonna do is we just watch, give you a little taste of the Murphy's Bar uh, scene. Uh, the highlight of which, just to just to get ready for it, is that this section begins with Professor Ashley not quite knowing how to answer a question that I've asked her. So here we go. Uh, I, uh, it would have happened probably December, January, 68 to 69. But this moment has really reached the level of legend. All right, let's go. I think we go in through the back. There you do it. All right. Okay. If it had been two other peoples I could think of, nothing would have happened. Nothing. I mean, it would. Have, I might as well have talked to the bartender. It looks the same. Oh yeah. Yeah. I really think it was this meeting that got the block plan started. Thank you. Hey, thank you. You're very welcome. All right, cheers to the block plan. That's Bud Light. Do <laughs> <laughs> you think it would have happened anyway had you not got together at Murphy's? No, I don't think it would. The turning point was when Don said, what I really like if I had my choice would be to have a small group of students that I could work with intensively without interruption. I like it better to listen to, to Diane Shern talk about it and said, oh no, but this was the real moment. You feel like this is the first time he said it? Or was this a thing that you'd been saying for a while and finally it was the right moment? Well, I do remember we were going to Breckenridge to ski. We stopped the car to get out and relieve ourselves. And Glenn said, you know, Don, I think we could do this one course at a time. 
But let me let me insert in that respect. <laughs> we were all still teaching regular full schedules yeah, right, at the same right, time. Right. And I don't remember the specific roadside stops. I, I made a lot of roadside stops on the way <laughs> up to ski. And each time you and got in to say to Don, I think we might do this. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> I want to make sure that we have, um, we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, I want to make sure we have time for questions, but um, what do you think, Susan? Did the, um, did the plan meet the expectations of its, its architects? Uh, the answer to that, I think, is yes and no. Uh, um, the yes part is that it definitely altered the college's sense of time. I mean, any, anyone who's lived lived on block plan time knows knows what it's like uh, it also did uh, bring a certain amount of, it did improve teaching and learning as they had anticipated and hoped but where it, it would have I think disappointed expectations was in its uh, rigidification instead of multiple types of, of courses there really is now one course single block courses three and a half week courses taught at one time during the day, unless of course they're off campus. But <clears throat> going to single block classes has uh, meant that the topics of classes are quite specialized and from virtually the very beginning, they knew that they had moved from breadth to depth. And <clears throat> that's what's uh, produced uh, a very rich and continually changing curriculum. One I think which is way more flexible than curricula elsewhere. So that's dynamic. And the other thing which is dynamic is, is uh, how much opportunity there is to, to change teaching strategies and tactics uh, with the, the canvas of, of three hours at least in a day. So I think they would be in some ways pleased with the outcome and in other ways um, they would say our expectation that it hardened into rigidities was in fact um, uh, born out by experience. So, uh, we're getting. Uh, we have some time for a few questions. We have a question okay. here from Elliot Mamet saying, "I wonder whether the Board of Trustees' opposition to the A Block schedule was par for the course. Did they typically get involved in academic matters, or was it unusual for the board to get so involved in matters typically left to the faculty?" Okay, that is a great question. A great question because. <clears throat> Um, one of the distinctive things about the approval of the block plan was, was the relationship between President Warner and the, and the president of the, of the Board of Trustees, Russell Tutt. And all that happened was, after the vote, George Drake, who was the dean then, wrote a letter to the Board of Trustees and said, we have done this. We're, we're letting you know that we have now moved away from semesters and to this uh, untried uh, system of intensive study. And uh, the faculty did a great job. That's all he said. And, and it was done. Uh, when Lou Warner retired as president, um, uh, things changed with the, between the board and, and the president. The real issue over the eight block year was, in fact, the intrusion of the board into academic matters. They said, uh, we will consider this eight block year provided that you give us uh, certain specific information, contingent on specific information. And, and Glenn Brooks, who was dean then, uh, felt that they really crossed the line. <laughs> he, also, he also reflects that he made uh, what he considers to have been an, uh, a remark, which probably wasn't as considered as he could have made it. He compared them to Soviet commissars, mm. which he said did not go down well with the conservatives on the board. Um, we have a, a, lot of, a number of questions here about the rationalization of moving from the uh, from the uh, nine to the eight block year. Like, what was the thinking behind that? It was essentially to uh, to allow for uh, for the faculty to have some time off uh, to do their research. I would imagine that was one one of the big considerations. Uh, or were there others? Um. <coughs> When they went to uh, uh, eight block teaching load in a nine block year, uh, faculty still had advising to do, committee work to do, um, 
uh, class preparation to do. And so they felt that if they could truncate the year, uh, they would have more time for professional development, and that means scholarship and research. Uh, so they wanted a better balance, not necessarily work less, they wanted a better balance between teaching and, and, and research. And by the time this became an issue, there was a whole new generation of faculty members who were at CC and um, who were very interested in research and very interested in, in, in their professional lives and, and felt that research was uh, um, a very significant part of what it was to be a good teacher, not just research on your class related things, but, but the scholarship that contributed to the discipline. And so I think the movement came from that and, and it was bound to happen that you would have faculty members who weren't attached to the, the origins of the plan. Mm -hmm. It wasn't savory. Um, a number of questions here. We have a couple of, just a, a little time for a couple more here. Uh, we have a reflection here from uh, Robert Zimmerman who says, have you realized that the block plan prepares students for the world after college, where in fact industry tends to have small groups work on one project at a time exclusively? This was a tremendous age in my successful post-college career. Probably not the first time you've heard a reflection like that. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. No, I think that I think that um, <clears throat> the, the efforts along the way to evaluate the block plan typically included alums. They really wanted to know, first of all, uh, could alums adjust to the, the real world? Um, and the answer was yes. Uh, what, about, what was it about the block plan that helped people when they moved into their careers or went to graduate school? And uh, <clears throat> when they did it in, at the end of the 70s and again in 1995, they learned the same things. That, that, um, people felt that they were able to, to execute ta tasks with a rapidity which other, others couldn't. They could tie in and, and, and do things. I think someone said that, well, I was assigned Moby Dick in a night, so I mean, I can do anything, you know, that sort of thing, or Moby Dick in a weekend. <clears throat> so that, that it, and then I think now the observation that, that working in small groups, project-oriented work in small groups and discussing things in small groups is, is important in, um, in industry and, and other fields. I, I think that's spot on because now that is very much the center of education here. Well, not at this moment, but generally. Um, and an interesting question here from Benedict Wright asking, mm -hmm. Susan, what in your research most challenged or complicated your personal recollection of the development of the block plan? Did, was there any moment, that's a great question, was there any moment in this where you were like, huh, that's, I don't remember it that way. Maybe I, uh, you know, maybe I'm a bit foggy on it. First, I will shout out to Benedict, who was a, a fantastic research assistant on this project. You know, I will say that the thing which shocked me the most is how little I remember about what was going on when I was actually experiencing as a witness, but even more disconcerting when I was directly involved in these things as chair of some committee. And so reading in the archives, I found out you know, dimensions of the existence of the college that I had lived through that had either completely passed by me by or were no longer part of my, of my knowledge set. Uh, but there were, there were surprises about things I never understood, you know, when I was here, you know, watching them. And I, could, I found out some of the answers to, to why somebody did what they did, because there they were saying why they did this weird thing. So, yeah, there were, there were some illuminations. One of, one, of the, uh, one of my favorite memories about doing this work is when we were in this at the basement of Armstrong Hall, there's this thing that's called the cage. Uh, and and the, the cage is actually a cage that, that cages in the historical uh, documents. It's not an archive, uh, but it's like, you know, it's, uh, it's something like an archive. We went in there and we found things that, that were very, very interesting. Um, and here's a question, maybe you'd be able to speak to you from Michelle Secor. How did the current students at the end of the year in 1970 adjust from a semester format to the block plan? What was their biggest story? You, now, you had just arrived at the college um, during that time. And were you conscious of, of students? Were they coming into your office being, you know, 
hey, you know, like maybe we should have you, maybe we should go back to the semester. Was there any of that? No. No, it was amazing. I mean, nobody ever, as I recall, nobody ever talked about semesters. Nobody, nobody ever complained about adjusting to the block plan. I think that there was this enormous excitement about doing something new. And I also think students felt that they had had a big part of, of promoting this. So, <clears throat> uh, no, I'm, I mean, I, but the, statistically, there were some students who felt that, that uh, there were a very few, maybe two to four percent who wanted to return to the semester system. And then a few more who said, well, I like the block plan with some changes. But it, students from the beginning were overwhelmingly positive about the block plan. I mean, the question they were asked is, do you like the block plan, which doesn't tell you much about whether it's good for them or not, but they did like the block plan. Yeah, and a related question, and I'm just, we're just going to tie it up, I think, after this one. is from David Bellina asking, did student input factor greatly in the adoption of the plan? This from a class of 1969 alum. So, uh, it did. Yes. Yeah, hugely, right? I, I think so. I think it had a, a great deal to do with it because, Remember I said that, that they had defeated, uh, resoundingly defeated the 4-2? Students were very much against that. They thought that they wouldn't get enough classes if they did four, only four courses per semester. And students influenced the outcome of that vote. And then their enthusiasm um, <clears throat> influenced the outcome of this vote to the point that some of the opponents of the block plan and the faculty really felt that they were being harassed by students. They were being pressured by students to embrace this, this new system. Uh, but uh, and yes, student, students did have a, a, a tremendous voice in this. It's, uh, it's, it was interesting. The, the actual place on campus where the vote takes place is in the basement of Loomis Hall, which is like, if you go down to it, you know, it's, it's not, it maybe it's, it's not generally like a space where we have faculty meetings anymore. And uh, one of the things we did in the filming of the documentary is we, we went down, uh, you know, Tim Fuller, Glenn Brooks, Owen Kramer, Michael Grace. We walked down, uh, some of us who were there, not me, but like some of them who were there for the vote. And I remember uh, Professor Kramer saying, uh, describing the vote and then students being lined on the stairs. If you can imagine the Loomis basement, lined on the Loomis basement stairs, waiting to hear what had happened uh, during the vote. The last question now from, from Jean Maurice Boyer. Uh, why haven't more colleges adopted the block plan? If it's so good, why haven't more places adopted it? That's a fantastic question. <clears throat> For one thing, they uh, they can count. What do you mean by that? <laughs> what I mean by that? <laughs> uh, they uh, faculty members in their right minds realize that that it is uh, it greatly increases their workload. Yeah. Whereas um, for CC, they were just starting out doing it, and so they they theoretically saw that it increased their workload, but they actually didn't realize the degree to which not just students, but faculty members live blocks. And it's, it's invasive, it's intense, it's very, very demanding. And, and, um, and knowing that and probably talking to people at CC and saying, how, how, you know, how is it? They must have gotten the answer. It is great for teaching, but it is overwhelmingly time consuming. And Cornell College, I think I saw a question. Yeah. I'll do it first. No, it followed the, it followed CC. And, you know, it's a strange thing to say at the 50th anniversary, but it's early days yet. You know, uh, you know, it is early days yet. One of the things that we are seeing, uh, I noticed in the, uh, one of our attendees at Tracy Freeman uh, from the Crown Center, uh, one of the things that we've had as many conversations about the number of calls that she's got and that we've all got mm -hmm. around the college from, um, from, from institutions that are really thinking about the block plan. And um, one, of the, one of the cool things that we're all part of it, Tracy, Susan, and I are part of this uh, once a month or once a block, if you will, global call with schools that are all over the world, uh, both in this country and in others, in Canada and Australia, 
uh, in South Africa, who are which are contemplating and actually not just contemplating, but moving. They're they're actually in the block plan. Uh, and one of the, one of the uh, we interview in in the documentary John Weldon uh, from Victoria University in Melbourne, that is now in its just approaching its fourth year of uh, of being on the block plan, uh, a much bigger institution. Uh, than Colorado College and their stories uh, as well. So, um, the I think that uh, you know we will see um, in the next fifty years maybe uh, a um, you know that this maybe this is maybe the block plan is a mode of uh, pedagogical delivery that technology is catching up with. Maybe maybe things are maybe things are changing right now. Everything is changing. You don't need me to tell you that. But uh, you know, I think it's I think there's many institutions that are thinking seriously about uh, the possibilities offered them by compressed modular learning. And that's about thinking about outside the schedule, which is really fundamentally what the block plan is about. Anyway, so on that note, perhaps, I want to thank you all and uh, and we will see you back uh, on uh, Valentine's Day we, not a, uh, for the release of these many things. I see that we're joined here by Tiffany Kelly. Hi, Tiffany. Hey there. Hey, I just wanted to offer a thank you. I hope everyone will join me in thanking Professor Susan Ashley and Steve Hayward. This is such a fascinating story and I'm thrilled that the two of you could join us today and dive more deeply into your process of exploring the making of the block plan. So thank you so much. Um, my name is Tiffany Kelly. I'm the Director of Alumni and Family Relations. For those of you who don't know me, thank you all for joining. Um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, and congratulate the class of 1970 on their 50th reunion this year. I look forward to meeting you all next year when we can celebrate in person. Um, and I also wanted to uh, second that 214 date. Steve, as you were saying that, I was thinking we could do 214 at 214 uh, for the release of, <laughs> <laughs> of the, those deliverables. Um, and then I also wanted to invite you who, who are on the, the, the call to, uh, to share your stories with us about your, um, your thoughts about the Black Plan. And uh, we have a, uh, we're working with communications on um, being able to share your video stories if you'd like to record something, if you want to write something in, um, I would encourage you to keep your questions coming as we look uh, for more programming around the Black Plan celebration in 2021. So uh, thank you all again. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. Thanks for the opportunity.